Hey guys, my name is Nurfami, and I am the Math and Foundation Stream Owner here at ACE. ACE, if you've never heard of us, is a community of machine learning practitioners and researchers who have gathered around topics in AI research, engineering, and products. We host free sessions like this three to five times a week and produce premium content in various subject areas. To see more, visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Explained, to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. We currently have more than 30 different streams that are focused on various ML topics, and this session is in Math and Foundations. Hope you enjoy it and come back. But uh, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce you to our speakers for today, um, Leoni Popo from EPFL and Anastasia Krestis from ETH, and they'll be talking about the Universal Approximation Theorem. So thanks for having us. I guess uh, I'll start off and we'll switch between uh, each other. Um, yeah, so we're uh, talking about uh, our recent joint paper and related background on exactly like uh, said, so non Euclidean uh, um, universal approximation. So basically the whole idea of the talk is kind of summed up in this little picture, but we'll make that a bit more explicit. Um, okay, yeah, so, okay, so what's uh, the motivation for uh, any of this? Okay, so before uh, we get into it, we should just motivate the use of geometry in modern machine learning. So why would we care about that? So the idea is basically that uh, many um, contemporary data sets or um, structures that we want to learn from usually uh, carry some additional structure that goes beyond just numbers. So incorporating that makes things more meaningful or improves predictions, depending. Um, so let's make this a bit more concrete. So some examples, uh, actually large class of examples come from matrix value data. So, for example, covariance matrices, they might see in uh, statistics or image um, processing. Uh, those are some specific matrices with specific structures. Of course, you want to, to um, preserve that when you make predictions so that it will be meaningful. Uh, there's low rank matrices that are usually used also actually in image processing to get some um, sort of dimension reduction of high uh, dimensional matrices. And those, of course, have specific structure, namely the rank. Um, there's graphs and the associated uh, matrix of uh, distances. So if you have weighted graphs, you can understand the weights um, between any sort of edges as sort of distance. And this is encoded in a certain type of matrix or structure. Now, it's not all about matrices. Um, other examples that we'll kind of see are compact sets. This is a very, very different uh, beast, but um, clearly non-Euclidean. Uh, there's one thing that's often talked about in the machine learning spheres. Uh, well, circles is this idea of uh, low dimensional um, feature representations or low dimensional manifolds that sort of describe um, in a non Euclidean way some higher dimensional um, object. So, this we won't really talk about too much explicitly in this talk today, but uh, this is a good uh, example. And lastly, uh, we'll touch on this point briefly to so statistical manifolds. So, these are sort of manifolds um, with some non Euclidean space whose points are different kind of probability measures. So we'll, we'll give an example of that explicitly today. Okay, so broadly put, the, the point of today, uh, today's talk or this paper that we'll be reviewing is um, the idea of being able to learn from general input spaces, which we'll define as, oh, denote as curly X, to some general output spaces Y, and we should understand those encoding some kind of structure, right? So any of those previous examples, but many others also. Right? And you want to do so while respecting these structures. Okay, so to get an idea of how we're going to go about this, we should start off at, I guess, where our um, paper sort of has one of its major roots, which is uh, the idea of universal approximation and sort of feed forward neural networks. All right, so in a series of papers, um, I guess in the late 80s and to the late 90s, uh, actually, and then recently uh, last year, uh, there's some major advances in the theory of uh, universal approximation of neural networks. And basically, what that says, uh, here you have the shallow version. Uh, so this is more or less in the 90s, says the following thing. It says, if you consider this class of functions, which you could brought, just basically understand as applying an affine transformation, then component-wise to that output of that transformation, this nonlinear sigma, uh, so it's a continuous function of certain type, and then you apply another affine transformation, or you can write them like this. Uh, this class is then able to approximate any continuous function to arbitrary precision on a given compact uh, sort of subset of the input space. Or uh, rapidly said, it's dense in the space of continuous functions in RD um, for the uniform and complex topology, if and only if this important function here, this continuous function, is not a polynomial. Right? 
So these are the so-called shallow neural networks. Um, and this is the original uh, universal approximation theorem, or actually it's improvement by these last two authors. Okay, so that's all and well, but in practice, uh, typically people don't use um, shallow neural networks of arbitrary um, complexity in terms of uh, this n here. Usually people go deep, uh, but have like a bound on the n. And so the question was open for a while uh, as to um, if you do that, um, is that universal, right? So can you approximate everything in a similar way if you put those kinds of restrictions on your networks and actually just keep composing this space? So um, actually last last year or yeah, more or less, uh, Terry Lyons and Patrick Kidd here together proved a theorem that said that if you um, bound the width of your network, so um, the, dimen the, the dimension, if you will, the co-dimension of each of those affine maps and you keep applying the sigma affine, sigma affine procedure, um, if you do that, and the sig this nonlinear sigma is non-affine continuous, and uh, the regularity condition is that it's continuously differentiable at least one point, then uh, if you use arbitrary deep networks whose width is at least this quantity here, so the input uh, dimension of the input space and dimension of the output space plus two, then you can get the, the analogous uh, approximation guarantee. In other words, for any target function, you can approximate it to arbitrary precision on an arbitrarily large but still compact uh, subset of your input space. Okay, and so we mentioned that there's many other authors who um, go, um, who look at variants of this, so different topologies and different notions, um, refinements in some ways. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'll just keep going until the first result and I'll pass it to Liani. Uh, so, okay, so let's, that's sort of the background universal approximation. We should give a quick other background about what we mean by non Euclidean spaces. Uh, so in this, uh, I guess, example, we'll talk about a manifold, right? So manifold actually encompasses a large part of our results, actually the main part of the results. So what is a manifold? Uh, broadly speaking, uh, the idea of a manifold is just a space that locally looks like Rn. So this picture sums up pretty well. Um, it looks, could be very exotic looking, but it's locally you can kind of deform it into a familiar Euclidean space. Um, so globally, what does it look like? Well, here are some examples. You know, so it can look very exotic. And that's about it. Um, so the last uh, thing I'll touch on here is uh, the, the last root of this particular talk, um, which is the qualitative universal approximation theorem for non-Euclidean spaces. Right? So in that case, uh, we'll deal with this sort of relatively general setting, but in some ways, uh, in many ways, less general than the one we'll be presenting in a moment. Um, so suppose we have a general input space X and a general output space Y. What we want to do is we want to relate these two uh, background ideas that I passed, so manifolds and approximation by neural networks. But I uh, specifically want to approximate any continuous function from X to Y in the same sense, so uniformly and complex. Okay, uh, but how do we do that? I mean, because we don't necessarily have uh, this uh, a notion of a tool to approximate in this space with. So the idea is we just want to repurpose our old tools, these uh, neural networks, whether it's shallow or deep, in this case, deep for us. And we want to do, do that by basically going around this little diagram here. So what does the diagram present? Oh, okay. So intuitively, we want to approximate f, which means we want to make this diagram approximately commute. So what does that mean? Well, what we first want to do is we want to represent x inside a Euclidean space by what is often called the feature map. Right, so this is a continuous transformation and maps into a Euclidean space. Then, uh, once we're there, we can then apply our familiar tools. So, for example, uh, in this talk, so we'll deep uh, neural network. So, I wrote it schematically like this. And then, of course, we need to return to our output space. So, then we do this opposite of a feed up, uh, feature map, which is sometimes called a readout map. So, in other words, you can think of this as parameterizing, and the key point is most of Y. Right? So, in other words, we so represent our space, we pass it through a specific neural network, and then we uh, kind of parameterize most of the output space in the right way, and then we can approximate f approximately. Okay, so yeah, the last point is the non-Euclidean universal approximation the theorem, the qualitative version. So if x is a topological space, uh, y is a metric space, so we should quantify this uniform notion of distance, and f is a function you want to learn, continuous. Then, uh, well, what do we need uh, to make this uh, problem make sense, and what conditions do we need on the feature map and the readout map? Well, for the feature map, we need feed to be continuous and injective. So this is strict. Actually, uh, you can show that this is necessarily insufficient. Um, 
For the readout map, things are a bit more tricky, as is usually the case in these types of diagrams. Um, so we need, of course, this continuity. That's, that's obvious. But then we need uh, two more things that are less and less obvious, uh, three more things. The first is that on its image, so where that feature map parameterizes, this should, of course, it has a right inverse because it's surjective. But we want that right inverse to be continuous. OK. OK, this is at least intuitive. The second thing uh, you'll kind of see um, throughout the machine learning literature, maybe not in this uh, phrasing, but the, the spirit of it is there, is that the image should grab most of the space, right? So in other words, you should be able to parameterize almost all of Y. What that means is it should be dense. But the key thing, so the key ingredient here, the subtlety, is that whatever you're not parameterizing, whatever you're missing, that should be um, not only negligible, but it should be uh, nice. And what that means, it should act like the boundary of a manifold, uh, topological manifold. And so I won't say uh, more about this right now, but we'll say more about it in the examples. And OK, in there, uh, I'll leave it to Leonie uh, right now. Uh, but the point, the punchline here is that if you do all those things, then you can get uh, your target function to arbitrary precision, just like in the other case. So let me stop sharing. Uh, just a quick question before we move on. Um, that qualitative universal approximation theorem, that gives us an upper bound um, on our level of precision, right? But does that tell us anything about the architecture of our neural net? Is that preset? Uh, OK, actually, this is a really good question. So uh, in the context of this talk, we're looking at deep feed for networks, but actually, uh, that particular theorem, it doesn't say anything about the architecture, and it actually applies to any universal class. But it'll never tell you anything about the complexity. So this is, yeah. So Lenny will take a, I guess, take it from here. That's a good question. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, OK, so, well, hello, everyone. So this is uh, the slide where uh, Anastasis left us. And uh, now we are going to um, move on to a more uh, on a refinement of uh, this theorem. And what I mean by refinement is that uh, we are going to see a more uh, quantitative um, uh, result uh, dealing again with uh, universal approximation. So in this case, um, we have uh, the same assumption as before. So our, spa our space is x and y, our maps uh, phi uh, and rho, with the same assumptions on the image of rho. But in addition, we uh, assume that the metric space uh, x is compact. And then we also introduce a map t that smooths away the boundary of uh, y uh, minus the uh, image of rho. Um, and uh, we um, also make use of the what is called the modulus of continuity of the function f, which kind of tells you how smooth in some way uh, the function f is. And uh, these two things, so the maps t and the modulus of continuity of f, are the main ingredients to um, estimate um, the, the depth of the network that is going to approximate um, f. So uh, let us assume that uh, the activation function sigma is uh, C infinity, so in, uh, infinitely differentiable, and non-polynomial. Uh, then um, we have our deep neural network um, hat f, which uh, approximates um, f, uh, and it has a width d plus m plus 2. Um, and uh, its depth uh, is uh, of the following order. So, um, well, uh, a lot of different quantities uh, appears uh, in this bound, but just quickly, uh, it is rather satisfying because here, what we have is a diameter of uh, the input space uh, as seen by phi, which is basically, it means that the depth of your network depends on the size of the input space. Then we have this exponent here. So it is polynomial with the uh, input dimension. Well, as the input space is mapped by phi. And then, uh, well, we have the, the red out and the future map here and here. And here we have the inverse models of continuity of this big function. And uh, basically what it tells you is that uh, the smoother your function 
is the less uh, deep your network need, uh, needs to be. Um, and it is quantified by uh, the um, input dimension, the output dimension, and the inverse models of continuity of um, the readout map. So um, here is uh, how main uh, quantitative uh, results. And um, just as a remark, if you take uh, the uh, input space um, X, well, uh, and the, um, uh, uh, if you take the input space X to be RG, or more precisely, a compact set in RG, and then the output space Y uh, to be RM, then uh, this result is simply a quantitative, a quantitative version of, uh, the, uh, of the theorem of Kidger and Lyons proven in 2020. Uh, so um, may, now we are going to move on uh, onto uh, example um, where our uh, results apply. So um, the first example I would like to give uh, is uh, when you want to use a new network to learn uh, from covariance matrices. So uh, let us denote by uh, P, uh, lower script D, upper script uh, plus the space of uh, symmetric positive definite matrices of size um, G times D. So this is uh, obviously uh, not an Euclidean space. Uh, and this space has somehow uh, been challenging uh, uh, for uh, several decades. So uh, the regression problem in this space uh, has been considered uh, uh, um, by Karcher um, in the late 80s. Um, then uh, Penek and Alias also consider this space uh, in, um, in through the lens of uh, uh, Romanian uh, geometry and to try to undo it with a remaining structure uh, to, yeah. Uh, and then uh, maybe in a more computational uh, flavor, Bernabel uh, introduced uh, online stochastic gradient algorithm. Um, so he tried to uh, extend uh, gradient descent in uh, this particular uh, remaining space. Uh, and then uh, other uh, consider a kind of a linear regre regression problem in, in, in the space of symmetric positive definite matrices. And most notably uh, in our context, uh, Kratios and Bilo uh, Kopitov um, uh, extended the use of deep neural networks to uh, this uh, uh, space of symmetric positive definite matrices. And here, how can you uh, use uh, our results in, our con in this context? Well, you simply uh, consider the logarithm uh, and the exponentials uh, in the exponential maps. So as defined for matrices, so based on uh, a Taylor expansion, like a formal Taylor expansion. And then what our uh, theorem tells you is that uh, universal, uh, uh, that deep neural, deep neural networks are universal in the space of continuous functions define and taking values uh, in the space of symmetric positive definite matrices. Plus, you get exactly uh, the same um, the same quantity of results. Um, so um, another uh, interesting uh, example is that of uh, Gaussian measures. So. Um, Typically, you can think of it as a kind of uh, toy example of generative adversarial networks, where um, the um, target um, the target measure is simply a Gaussian measure on uh, R D. So um, yeah, it has to be a non-degenerate Gaussian measure, uh, so that the covariance matrix is um, symmetric and positive definite. And then we just denote by mu uh, the the mean of uh, this Gaussian measure. And so um, Donson and Lando have uh, studied um, the two Wasserstein distance on the space of Gaussian measure on RD. And well, usually uh, the, uh, the two Wasserstein distance is um, hard to compute, but in that case, uh, it is rather uh, easy and well, uh, it's not easy, but it gives uh, an easy, uh, let's say, expression, uh, which is uh, here. And so um, uh, 
what we can say is that we can actually use our deep uh, our construction to uh, go from Rd, so typically uh, on just a vector, to uh, a measure uh, value uh, output and um, by using our uh, construction. Um, yeah, so um, this is all for me, well, as far as uh, examples are, are concerned. But uh, Anastasis is going to uh, provide you some more. Um, so I, 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 I stop sharing my screen and uh, let him the. In a second, I mean. <laughs> cool. Right. Can everyone see my screen okay? Cool. Uh, okay, so I'll present uh, two other examples and then I'll pass it back to Lenny. So, okay, so what are some other uh, examples, specifically some that we um, com come up often, at least? Um, okay, so one example that uh, is the following. So this one is kind of, um, it's almost folklore in the machine learning uh, world right now. It's like something that's sort of believed, it's probably true, it seems to be true, but I mean, it's an easy consequence of a result. Uh, so this is the idea of uh, parameterizing convex combinations, right? So as an example, I mean, this is a nice uh, picture telling us what our space looks like. You know, this is all the possible combinations, uh, portions of three things, X, Y, Z. Um, yeah. When does this come up? One example is when you're mixing expert opinions. Uh, so you're given some expert opinions. You want to find the optimal combination model. This happens a lot. Actually, uh, mixture models in statistics. Suppose you have some, uh, you have, say, and different uh, densities or something, and you want to find the right proportion because you believe that represents your data properly, but you want to sort of have that depend continuously on some inputs since you should be able to vary. Uh, that, that also falls into this uh, class of examples. Another one is uh, clustering with Gaussian. So I mean, sometimes you might see uh, Gaussian mixture models used uh, to cluster. So these are three hot examples. Um, okay, so what's our space? Well, I'll denote it by delta n, sometimes called the standard simplex. Uh, so an element, just to write it a bit more formally, of the space is well, beta. Uh, so it has coordinates in 0, 1, uh, the power of n. But the key point here is that um, its entries have to sum up to 1, right? So this just means your combinations should all ultimately explain everything, right? So that's it. So bn is the proportion of each thing you're sort of, I want to say investing in, but I don't want to say that. Yeah, uh, we'll say investing in. That's the proportion of each the nth um, item. Okay, uh, so how does our theorem apply? Well, if we take our, our feature map just to be, for example, the identity uh, on our input space, it doesn't, doesn't apply, doesn't change anything in this example. And the readout map is this sort of famous uh, softmax function, so this uh, um, sort of exponential ratio, you know? So um, then the point of our result is that if you use these modifications to your network, which are the ones that are used in practice, then you get universality. So why is this subtle? Why is this not obvious? It's because the softmax function and this goes back to the condition and the smoothing operator that Leonie talked about, this TS. The softmax function maps into the interior of the simplex, which means that this little hard edge, uh, which is pub, which is, I mean, you know from like classical complex optimization that most are, are optimal are always going to be on the boundary. Actually, the uh, so basically the decisions we probably want to take or represent are going to be there. Um, if you think of this as an optimization problem, the softmax function was always going to mix miss that. It's always going to go to the interior. So the key thing is that the smoothing operator, this TS that Lenny talked about, what it does, it could be visualized very clearly in this picture, is it takes the target function, it kind of just pushes it a bit into the, the simplex, so it lies in the interior, and this is where this uh, sort of smoothing effect comes from. Then, you know, because the softmax uh, is subjective on the interior, you can approximate it perfectly, so then uh, that's it. So then together you sort of delete the boundary with this smoothing operation, and that's where this sort of Subtle trick comes into play, but nice to visualize here. Cool. Uh, so we get universality. And this other one that I want to talk about, sort of a similar flavor, but actually very different flavor. Um, so this one, uh, okay. So so one of the main tools we use neural networks for, or at least on blogs, <laughs> is uh, is, is uh, classification. Right. So oftentimes, one of the first examples you'll see uh, is neural networks are good for classification. But actually, that's a lot harder to prove um, than approximation. 
Okay, so how do new people usually classify? Well, one classic way is you modify the output of the neural network uh, with studying practice. Say it's just a bi like um, a bivariate classification, uh, binary, sorry. Um, so you apply the logistic map and you interpret this as sort of a probability between zero and one, and then you threshold, right? Uh, sorry, this should be a half one. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Okay, so yeah. So then in, in 1993, uh, Farago and Lugosi um, basically proved that uh, if you sort of endow this problem with sort of a latent probabilistic structure, then with high probability, you can approximate uh, the indicator function that tells you if you're in or not in the class uh, point-wise in probability. So rather weak sense. Um, but let me just argue one quick thing uh, so I can pass the, the non-Euclidean setting, why this is not what we want to do. Okay, so we look at this really uh, extreme example of why point-wise convergence is not uh, appropriate for understanding classes. So consider this, uh, so okay, suppose we're living in the compact zero one, this is our space, well, this is our backdrop, and we look at the constant sequence of indicator functions on the open ones, right? And so this is a constant sequence, and what does it converge pointwise to? It converges pointwise to itself, it's constant, um, but it, it never classifies zero one properly. But intuitively, it seems like we should, like, zero one should be able to grab the closed interval, right? So this point-wise isn't the right notion of convergence um, for sets. So briefly, the idea is then actually, if you view this as a, um, if you view, if you understand actually the space of indicator functions of open sets, this can be, uh, it's sort of in the reach of our theorem just by doing this modification of the output, then it can be shown that if you quantify convergence of indicator functions of open sets, um, I can relate this to closed sets, but it's a bit of a longer story. Um, as, okay, so basically what we wanted above. So a sequence of indicators of open sets converges to another indicator of an open set. If, um, if you look at the complements, so the closed sets, if uh, the closed set of the limit contains all of the limits of all possible subsequences, okay? So this seems really abstract, but for example, here, uh, this constant sequence, uh, we can understand it as converging, uh, where there's the zero one, the open set converges, uh, this constant sequence of sets converges to the closed set zero one because say the constant sequence, uh, sorry, the sequence one over n lies inside him. So it eventually accumulates at zero and the sequence, con the sequence lies inside this constant set, uh, one minus one over n, so accumulates the one. So this guy should be the limit of these guys, right? So these aren't open and closed, but, uh, I give this example because it's easier to define the setting. So if you imbue our, a space of indicator functions of open sets uh, with uh, this notion of convergence, which can be shown to be uh, handleable by um, our results, then you take the feature map to be X, you take the readout map to be exactly the one that's used in practice, and you get universality in this sort of space, right? I won't define it more than that in details, but that's the idea. So by going non-Euclidean, you can basically prove something that's was believed for a long time, but it's really hard to show. So now I pass back to Leoni. Um, Oh, you're on mute, Leonie. Oh, <laughs> you're on mute. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. So um, well, uh, now I guess it's it's more or less time to uh, conclude. So uh, just briefly, um, we are. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, discuss the scope uh, of uh, of our results. So um, what we have uh, presented here is um, a global uh, universal approximation theorem, both uh, qualitative and quantitative. But uh, in our paper uh, with uh, Anastasis, uh, we derive a local analog of this uh, theorem for more general input and output spaces. Um, and uh, more precisely, um, we can of um, uh, we show that um, neural networks can uniformly approximate a function if they are uh, restricted to a ball. And we provide estimate for the maximum radius um, of this ball. Um, and on this ball, actually local approximation um, hold. 
Um, so, and well, you can just think, well, it's a kind of, you know, like proof artifact as we uh, sometimes have in, in mathematics, but actually we show more than that. Uh, we show, we uh, exhibit situation where uh, local and global versions do not coincide so that you really need uh, this local condition if you want to show, uh, uh, if you want to show uh, approximation. Um, we uh, so th in the examples that uh, we presented today, we assume that the activation function sigma was uh, infinitely uh, differentiable uh, and non-polynomial. But actually, uh, our paper covers uh, a, a wide, a, a broader class of activation functions, and more precisely, uh, they cover all activation functions that are uh, considered in uh, the theorem of Kijer and Lyons that uh, we have mentioned in the uh, introduction. Um, and also, uh, why need so the uh, output space need not. Uh, have a metric, and this may be uh, important in uh, classification. So, um, what well, you should um, remember of this talk, well, you, uh, um, um, global universal approximation theorem extends to uh, deep neural networks, and uh, to deep neural networks with very general input and uh, output spaces. And moreover, what you should remember is that uh, you can actually give uh, quantitative estimates on the width and the depth of um, those uh, approximating uh, deep neural network. So, but um, this is not the end of the story and a lot of things uh, remain to be uh, investigated. So um, most notably, uh, so, We've, we presented you this uh, example um, where, um, well, I presented you this example where I told you, well, you can use our result to um, approximate uh, functions that uh, takes values in the space of Gaussian mergers. But actually, a, a, a further step will be to exhibit an architecture that is able to learn uh, merger valued functions and not only Gaussian uh, valued uh, functions. Then uh, another interesting direction is to look at uh, discrete uh, geometric spaces, such as graph, um, as um, Anastasis briefly mentioned in the introduction. Uh, and then also one could think of, um, uh, um, of neural networks that could approximate uh, functions defined on uh, more general manifolds. And another uh, interesting problem, and I will conclude with this, uh, is the uh, approximation of uh, stochastic processes. Uh, and this is typically uh, interesting for people working in finance uh, who would like, for example, to uh, use neural network for um, deep aging. So, well, uh, I hope you, you enjoy the talk. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, Anastasis and I are here to uh, answer. Thank you very much. And uh, well, we also have um, references in the slides and they will be probably put online. So if you want to check uh, out any of the papers we mentioned, you have the references. So I wanna give a hand to Anastasia and Neoni for presenting such a cool paper. Um, and for you guys, thank you for joining us. And to see more free content like this, please remember to visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. I think we're done. Xiang, what's up? Awesome.